Okay, so our wave functions for the rigid rotor that take this form, a normalization constant, polynomial in cosine of theta that is related to the Legendre or associated Legendre polynomials, and then an exponential term involving phi that is complex. Uh, those wave functions we have seen are normalized, or at least we can choose the value of n to guarantee that they're normalized. They have one other property that's very handy, which is that the they're orthogonal, and what I mean by that is every pair of wave functions in this full set of wave functions is orthogonal to each other. So uh, we say that the set of wave functions are mutually orthogonal so any pair that I choose as long as they're not the same as each other they end up orthogonal. So just as a reminder of what these words mean the function is normalized if the integral of a wave function squared is equal to 1. And orthogonal means the integral of a wave function times a different wave function. So if I take this wave function, psi sub Lm, multiplied by a different one, L prime, L m prime, then that's not going to come out equal to 1, but it's going to come out equal to 0 if either L prime is not M prime or if L is not equal to L prime or if M is not equal to M prime. So that's what it means for these wave functions to be orthogonal. We can do a quick example and make sure that's clear. Let's say take two of the, the simpler wave functions, the psi 1, 1 wave function, the psi 0, 0 wave function, L equals 1, M equals 1, L equals 0, M equals 0. In this case, they, th both the L's and the M's are different from each other. But we can ask uh, either are they orthogonal to each other or not, or since I've already told you that they're going to be, we can verify that they're going to be orthogonal. So we can say, is it true that the integral of psi 1, 1 star times psi 0, 0 is going to come out to be 0? If so, then the two functions are orthogonal to one another. So to do this, we need to be able to write down what the wave functions are. And we would use this expression to write them down. We don't particularly care about the values of the normalization constants when we're dealing with orthogonality. Either this is going to come out to be equal to 0, or it's going to come out to be something that's not 0. And the value of n won't change whether it's equal to, to 0 or not. So I'll leave the n's alone. I won't bother to normalize these functions and find the values of n for either the 1, 1 or the 0, 0 wave function. The Legendre polynomial when l equals 1 and m equals 1, that's one we've seen before. That's sine theta. And then I've got an e to the m or e to the 1 times i times phi. Uh, if I then take the complex conjugate, it becomes negative. So that's the complex conjugate of the psi 1, 1 wave function. Psi 0, 0, that's the particularly simple one. That's just a normalization constant. The 0, 0 Legendre polynomial is 1. And e to the 0 phi gives me 1. So I want to do that integral over d theta and d phi with the sine theta integration factor. So I've got a theta integral and a phi integral. That's, again, an integral we want to know whether that does or doesn't come out equal to 0. I'll go ahead and pull the constants out front. Those aren't going to make the function equal to 0. I'll break the integrals up into first the theta part of the integral, and then separately the phi part of the integral. The theta integral, I've got a sine theta and a sine theta. Sine squared theta integrated from 0 to pi. That's already looking like not great news. That's an integral we know how to do. Integral of sine squared theta from 0 to pi, that's going to be, it's going to have a particular value. The value is pi over 2. But in particular, uh, it's not equal to 1, but it's also not equal to 0, which is the more important fact. That integral is not equal to 0. If this integral is going to come out equal to 0, it's not going to be because of the normalization constants. 
it's not going to be because of this theta term. If it's equal to zero, it's only going to be because of this term. So let's see if that works out. The only phi dependence I have is this e to the minus i phi term. So I need to know what is the integral of e to the minus i phi uh, when phi goes from zero to two pi. So that integral is the one we should focus on because that's the only one that has any hope of making this thing equal to zero. Integral of an exponential is just an exponential where I need some constants out front just to double check if I take the derivative of this function, derivative of this function pulls down a minus i, the minus cancels the minus, the one over i cancels the i, and I get back this function. So this is the correct integral of e to the minus i phi evaluated from zero to two pi. That's looking a little weird. One over i with a negative sign out front of it, that's certainly not gonna help me get to zero. But if I plug in the upper and lower limits of this definite integ integral, so this is going to become minus one over i e to the minus i times two pi minus using the lower limit e to the zero. So the e to the 0, we know what that is. That's equal to 1. But e to the 2 pi i is also equal to 1. e to the minus 2 pi i also equal to 1. So the, the few small facts you need to understand about complex numbers in order to do quantum mechanics at this level are, number one, how to, do, how to take complex conjugates. Number one, not to be too frightened when you see an i showing up in equations, and number three, a fact that we frequently need to use is the fact that e to the 2 pi i equals 1. So that fact I've used in this expression. e to the minus 2 pi i is just 1 over e to the 2 pi i, which is 1 over 1, which is still 1. So using that fact, e to the minus 2 pi i is equal to 1, and now we see that 1 minus 1 is going to be 0. So remember what we're calculating is the phi portion of this integral. That's the work we've just done here. The phi integral gives us 0. So after all of this work, we find that the full integral, this overlap integral between the 1, 1 wave function and the 0, 0 wave function does turn out to be 0. And we see that those two wave functions are indeed orthogonal to each other. And in fact, any time we have m not equal to m prime, you can see exactly why that's going to work. If I have any amount of e to the i phi that doesn't end up canceling in this uh, phi portion of the integral, then the integral, the phi portion of the integral is going to come out equal to zero, just like it did here. So anytime m is not equal to m prime, then the phi integral will work out to be zero. If m does happen to equal to m prime, then this integral won't be zero, but the l part of the integral will be. So anytime either one of these quantum numbers is different for the two wave functions, then the overlap integral between them will work out to be zero, and every pair of different wave functions for the rigid rotor uh, comes out orthogonal to uh, each other. So every one of these pairs of integrals is mutually orthogonal. As a result, if all of our wave functions are both normalized and the full set is more mutually orthogonal, then the other way to say those two facts is to say that those wave functions form an orthonormal set. So they're orthonormal, probably better to say they are an orthonormal set of wave functions. So that fact will be useful uh, when dealing with rigid rotor wave functions occasionally. And then now the next thing we have to do now that we have a, a more complete understanding of these wave functions is to use them again in the Schrodinger equation and figure out what the energies of these wave functions.